Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial. We invite you to follow us on Twitter at MacArthur1880 or find the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial on Facebook. In October 2018, the MacArthur Memorial hosted a World War I symposium that focused on the year 1918. Dr. Mitchell Yockelson presented a lecture entitled, 47 Days, How Pershing's Warriors Came of Age to Defeat the Germans During the Meuse-Argonne. It's a pleasure to be here and also to be the opening act for two distinguished historians. So what I'm going to talk about is a book that I wrote a couple of years ago, 47 Days, How Pershing's Warriors Came of Age to Defeat the German Army in World War I. And it's my belief that because of the Americans who persevered in the longest battle in American military history, 47 days long. It eventually involved about 1.2 million American troops uh, plus support, including women who I'll discuss as well. That's the reason why the Germans finally capitulated with an armistice on November 11th of 1918. Here in the front is uh, American troops in American First Army who are basically elated about the surrender. But it really wasn't a surrender, it was an armistice. It just meant that the fighting had stopped, now the negotiating would begin. And fighting continued up until 11 a.m. on November 11th. The fighting actually in some cases continued shortly after that, trying to get messages to the troops at the front. The Germans in some areas were appalled that the American Allied forces were continuing to fight even though an armistice had been agreed upon early that morning. The um, overall commander of the Allied forces, um, Marshal Ferdinand Foch, who I'll introduce you to in a few minutes, was adamant that the Allies continue to push up through the very last moment. Because again, this was an armistice. He was worried that the Germans were going to renege on the promise, turn around and attack the Allies, and continue the war, and catch the Allied off guard. So his, his uh, push was to keep on fighting up until the 11th. So we'll talk a little bit about the battle. We'll talk about the key commander, uh, General Pershing, who I grew to really admire during the research for this book. And um, we'll conclude with the impact of the battle, and hopefully I'll allow enough time for some questions and answers. Here is General Pershing. Just a quick background on him, in case you're not as familiar with him as, as I might be. In any case, Pershing, uh, born in 1860, uh, a year or so later, uh, the, of course, the Civil War is going on. The town of Laclede is raided by Confederate guerrillas. Young John is with his father in a general store. He's scared. He's clinging to his father's leg. The town is getting shot up. His father, who was a prominent Unionist, had his store targeted. He grabs his young son, drags him out through the back door of the store in an alleyway back to the house. Um, the senior Pershing grabs a shotgun. His wife clings to him and says, what are you doing, you idiot? You can't fight against these guerrillas. They're better armed than you are. You're going to get yourself killed. He backs off. Um, the town is pretty much destroyed, but they survive. But the image of the fighting really impacts Yonk John. And even though the Pershings had a strong lineage of the French and Indian War and uh, the Rev War, War of 1812, his descendants fighting there, he had no interest in the military. But later on, just due to financial circumstances, the Pershings, like a lot of Americans after the Civil War, had a difficult time. There's no money to send him to college. He wants to teach and maybe go on to law school. His sister sees a uh, advertisement in the local Laclede newspaper advertising for a West Point uh, admission. She says, here's your chance. He takes the exam, does well enough to get into an entrance. He's a couple of years older than most of the cadets, but he, he excels not so much academically, but he excels as a leader. He ends up being captain of cadets the entire four years he's there. After the war, he goes on to different commands, including African-American troops out west, and also commands them a second time during the Spanish-American War. He would end up teaching at the University of Nebraska in what we would think of today as a ROTC program, earns his law degree, has the chance to quit the Army, but he decides he really kind of likes it. He likes the Army life. He likes the leadership. 
Uh, he would go back to West Point as an instructor, and he's a horrible instructor. He talks in a monotone voice. Plus, he's really nasty to the cadets, which is surprising to them since he was a former cadet himself. And behind his back, they mock him. They call him the N-word Jack. Later on, that softened to Black Jack, and it's a moniker that sticks with him the rest of his life. Um, later on, he would go out and he would serve in the Philippines. He would be an observer in the Russo-Japanese War. He would get married, have four children with um, the uh, youngest daughter of a U.S. senator who was head of the military affairs. Tragically, a fire broke out where they were living in San Francisco, and his wife, Frankie, and three of the four children were killed. Uh, only his son, Warren, would survive. Pershing even more would stay in the military, and he would continue on fighting um, in the Mexican punitive expedition. And then in World War I, he would be made command of the American Expeditionary Forces. Often see AEF in the uh, singular, but actually it's plural, forces at the end. Pershing would be given the command of the AEF. They weren't quite sure, they being the War Department, of what the AEF was going to consist of initially. Um, was it going to be a small contingent? The French and the British were clamoring for American troops to be so-called amalgamated under their command. President Wilson, who wasn't much of a military strategist, but he knew a thing about diplomacy, and he was thinking ahead of when the war eventually would end, and he was hoping that it would be the Americans that would bring the war to an end, thought, okay, if American troops are amalgamated, in other words, serving under British and French command, we're not going to have a much say at the table. So he gave Pershing basically strong latitude as how he would command the AEF. And in some ways similar to what President Lincoln gave Ulysses Grant in 1864, Pershing was told you will command American fighting force, you will cooperate with our allied partners, but you will fight independently. Pershing was all in favor of that, but history shows that we did have to lend some troops to the British for a while, also some troops to the French including African-American soldiers. Pershing would head over on the maiden voyage to um, France by way of England, leaving in May of 1917. This image is of him aboard the Baltic. It was a small contingent of officers, including an aide, uh, George S. Patton. Once he got to France, he was given... Um, um, he was given use of Chalmont, the uh, French military headquarters in the area near the Marne River. Pershing would establish the AEF in the same sense as how the French organized G1 for personnel, two for intelligence, three for operations, and so forth. It was slow going in getting the Americans over. We didn't have the shipping. We relied heavily on the British to help us out with that. Also, Pershing didn't have much at his disposal as far as what the American troops were going to look like. But he persevered. Um, eventually, they would be regular Army troops and professional soldiers. They would be National Guardsmen, the state troops who were called up and federalized by President Wilson, and then making up the main contingent of the AEF were the drafted troops. The first time a draft was instituted since the Civil War, and that would be the National Army along with... Um, soldiers who would enlist at their local enlistment booth. Pershing would spend time here at this uh, luxurious residence near Chalmont, and he would also uh, spend time in Paris at this uh, nice little chateau, his Petitaire, that was owned by the financier Ogden Mills. Uh, Pershing would get around like all the Allied commanders by rail car. He wanted his own rail car, and it was fitted out with an office, sleeping quarters, and a kitchen. Pershing, who by the time of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive um, was uh, 58 years old, was in excellent health, despite he did have a bout of the flu during the battle. But it's said that he would walk the length of the entire rail car, regardless of the weather. He dragged some young um, aide or officer with him who would have to march back and forth. The image here is of the crew that took care of the rail car for Pershing. The African Americans in the picture are... Uh, former Pullman porters, gentleman to the far right with the Sam Brown and the mustache, that's Major Thornton. He, uh, was head, he headed the Palmer House Hotel in Chicago, which still exists today under the, um, the Hilton brand. So Pershing would use the train to get around to all the fronts where the American supply bases are. And um, one of the reasons that he spent time in France was this young woman, about 30 years 
30 years younger than him. This is Micheline Resco. She was a Romanian portrait artist who painted portraits of most of the Allied diplomatic and military leaders. They met shortly after Pershing came to France at a party in Paris. She was asked to paint his portrait. Um, she painted more than his portrait. They became linked romantically. Now, I mentioned briefly that Pershing had lost his wife and his children. He was a widower. Uh, before he came over to the to France, he had actually been dating Nina Patton, who was one of George Patton's sisters. Nina thought that uh, the two of them were going to get married. They corresponded heavily. Uh, by the time that Pershing got to France and met Micheline, unfortunately, she got the dear Nina letter that he had met somebody else. Their relationship, um, oddly enough, was kept secret. Pershing would go to see her as much as he could in Paris. She lived in a, an apartment with her mother. They would write to each other more often. The letters that actually exist today. They were um, recovered by uh, one of Pershing's biographers, Donald Smythe, in the 60s or 70s, and they exist in St. Louis at the Catholic Archdiocese. And they're very loving letters. It shows a different side to Pershing. Pershing, by most biographers' accounts, or even those that knew him during the war, he was somewhat gruff. He was very much the micromanager. He had a certain idea of how a fellow officer or even an enlisted man should be, and he let you know about it. But through the letters, you, we see that he and Micheline, it was a very tender relationship. And when they didn't see each other, they would send letters bemoaning the fact that it had been a while since um, they were together. Despite the fact that Pershing wanted to keep his relationship with Micheline a secret, I think he was a little bit shy of the fact that, A, he was 30 years older than her. Also, he very much was in love with his wife and missed her terribly. It was the worst kept secret in the army. Everybody knew that General Pershing had a lady friend in um, Paris. They actually stayed together for the rest of his life. 1946, when he was um, staying at uh, uh, Walter Reed in the so-called Pershing Suite, they would end up getting married. He brought Micheline and her mom to the United States. They stayed in Washington, D.C. in 1940 when the Germans took over. Meanwhile, as the AEF is building up and getting ready to take their first um, actions in battle, they received a significant amount of support from Secretary of War Newton D. Baker. Baker had only been on the job for less than two years. In fact, he took over as Secretary of War, I think it was the day before the Mexican punitive expedition in March of 1916. Baker was a businessman from Cleveland. He really knew nothing about the Army. In fact, um, Smythe, and he writes about Pershing, he mentions about uh, Baker, and he says he didn't even play with toy soldiers when he was a young boy, but he learned to understand the Army. He came over and he saw Pershing a number of times during the war, would visit the supply bases. This particular image was taken shortly before the San Miel attack in September. You see Baker in the middle there, decked out with his doughboy helmet, his gas mask. He kind of, in his suit, he kind of looks like a preacher, but he also reminds me, you remember that photograph of Michael Dukakis when he's popping out of the tank? He sort of reminds me a little bit of that, but really Baker was an outstanding Secretary of War, fully supportive of Pershing and fully supportive of the American troops. The guy that Pershing would run into the most trouble with, and this is a stage photograph because they look like they're the best of friends. They were about the same height. Uh, Pershing was six foot one. I think uh, Foch was a little bit taller than him. Foch was under a tremendous amount of pressure. He was appointed um, in 1918 as the overall commander of all the Allied forces. He was in a difficult position with Pershing because technically speaking, he's Pershing's boss. But really, President Wilson is Pershing's boss. So he can sort of boss Pershing around, but not really. And he's feeling the heat. The war is continuing. The Germans, of course, know that Americans are coming over. And there's more than a million of them over by the spring of 1918. And they launched their major offensive. The Americans really haven't seen much action. Ed will get into the spring fighting of involving the American troops. So I won't talk about that. But... Foch is really worried that it's taking so long for both the Americans to deploy overseas, but once they get there, they're mostly in quiet sectors and they're not participating in the fighting. They go back and forth and they battle it out. Finally, in August of 1918, when Pershing says, I want to form an independent fighting force, it'll be American First Army, I want to command it along with the entire AEF. 
Foch is in agreement with this, but he's like, when are you going to get into the fighting? One of their discussions, which happened at the French headquarters where this photo was taken outside, they almost got into fisticuffs. They screamed at each other, even though neither knew each other's language. Pershing knew a bit of French. Foch knew a bit of English, but they certainly, through the yelling, could comprehend each other. Uh, they stormed out. Eventually, they would come to an agreement that Pershing would indeed be allowed to form the first army, and they would go on the offensive. Pershing wanted a major operation against the Samiel salient. There's a great display talking about Samiel just outside that I urge you to look at. But it was a bulge in the lines, just like there were a number of these during the war that the Germans created in 1914. And it prevented American troops, I'm sorry, Allied troops from not only going forward in their own operations, but it also helped shield um, German supplies from coming in, more German troops, and protected some coal, coal fields. Pershing felt that eliminating the Samuel salient really was the key to the war. While Foch didn't necessarily disagree because French troops had been trying to take Samuel since 1914 and had failed miserably, he was putting together a major Allied attack on all of the fronts that would take place in September of 1918. And he wanted Pershing and the First Army to attack along a front between the Meuse River and the Argonne Forest. It was about a 60 or so mile front. Pershing said, that's fine, but I want Samuel. I want a major offensive. They went back and forth, and finally, uh, Foch said, okay, but a limited offensive. Once you've occupied the salient, you will go no further. Pershing wanted to continue on to Metz. Foch put a, a clamp on that. So they agreed that the Samuel attack would take place about the second week in September. But then right after that, beginning on September 26, in conjunction with the other Allied offenses, that's when the Meuse-Argonne would kick off. Pershing agreed to do so. It was a mighty big task. The, uh, the attack takes place um, beginning with an artillery barrage on the 11th. It's horrible weather. If any of you have been to France around this time of year, it's often rainy. Although I was there recently, it was sunny every day, just like it is here. But it was horrible weather. The Americans jumped off. The Germans had an inkling that something was going to happen, and they had planned a withdrawal anyway. They started to withdraw, but they didn't withdraw quick enough because the Americans completely overran them. And by the 12th of September, most of the salient was in American hands. Uh, these two images here show French citizens who are now able to go back to their villages. Either they had had to travel miles away and stay out of harm's way. Some of them were living in barns without electricity, without any kind of heat, proper food, clothing, and water. Now came back. Pershing was a savior. Newspapers around the world, not just in France and the U.S., but around the world, proclaimed Pershing as this great American hero. But he had little time to gloat over San Miguel. Eventually, after about the 14th of September, the entire salient was in American hands. But he had to prepare his forces, which there were now more than 2 million American troops over in France. Um, and about a million of them would be in his American First Army for the attack on the Meuse Argonne. Pershing was given use of the mayor's office, the Marie, here um, in Suyi, France. It's a little village in between Verdun and the rare area of Bar-le-Duc. Pershing had his headquarters up on the third uh, floor. He could overlook what he was facing was a large airfield commanded by uh, Billy Mitchell. Also, there was a large hospital and a telephone operator's hut, among other things. Again, it reminds me a lot of City Point, which the Union Army used in Virginia in 1864. Shifting troops from Samuel plus other parts of the front to get them ready for a jump off on September 26 was a very difficult task, and most of that was charged with George C. Marshall. We know a lot about Marshall, the chief of staff during World War II. Of course, we know about him with his rebuilding of Europe after World War II. But he really cut his teeth during the First World War, and I would say he's one of the unsung heroes of the war. He was a protege of Pershing, worshipped the guy, but he was darn smart. He started out in the First Division. He was the mastermind bef uh, behind one of the first American efforts, which was at Contini. Pershing saw that, brought him over to the AEF, and then brought him over to the First Army. He directed the American troops forward to the Meuse-Argonne front, and it was a difficult task for one thing, 
He was worried that the Germans would see American troops heading towards that area, so all the movements had to be done at night. And then the other thing is there were only three main roads leading to the Meuse-Ardan front. Many of them had been shell pocked bombed since 1914, but especially in 1916 during the Verdun battle. So they were rough roads to traverse. And as I already mentioned, it was raining all the time. So he had to move American troops forward while French, Italian, and other Allied troops came back from the rear. Um, any of you who have been caught in the traffic near here on 664 pretty much have an idea of what I'm talking about. But Marshall did it splendidly, and so by the 25th of September, the American troops were in position for an early morning attack. Meanwhile, a key component to this was communication. Pershing was frustrated from the first day he got to France when he realized that by sending messages to his allied, his commanders and the allied troops around the Western Front, it was done through French telephone operators. And the calls would get confusing, the messages weren't relayed properly. So he complained to the War Department in Washington, who got the Signal Corps together to bring in telephone operators. They recruited through the Bell system. This is before the, um, they were all conglomerated into AT&T, but they had Western Bell, Southern Bell, and so forth. They recruit women who could speak French pretty fluently, can also handle the pressure. So as you can imagine, there were a lot of um, women who applied uh, from the, uh, the New England area who were from Canadian descent. They had to take rigorous exams, and these women were brought over and they also became unsung heroes. They were affectionately known as Hello Girls. This particular image is taken at Samuel. They were so far to the front that they were also given, um, or issued, I should say, doughboy helmets and gas masks. None of those women had ever been, were under fire during the war. The closest they came actually was a fire broke out in the hut. But they were um, splendid in the work that they did, and they're only now getting the credit that they deserve. Meanwhile, the planning for Meuse Argonne had to consider what they were going to be up against, and that were these uh, machine gun nests, these concrete pillboxes that dotted the landscape all over, not the Meuse Argonne front, but pretty much everywhere on the Western Front. They were either constructed of prefabricated concrete that the Germans brought up by narrow gauge rails, or they actually did the mixing of the concrete at the front. But the Germans were the masters of defense. And if you go to France today, you see literally hundreds of these still exist in farm fields, up on hills, by barns, you name it. And so the Americans were going to have to penetrate and somehow get around these machine gun nests. Early on the morning of the 25th of September, the battle kicked off with almost 4,000 artillery guns fired by American and French troops. All of the guns were French-made, 105, 75s, 110s, various calibers. One of the batteries firing was by the gentleman on the horse, future U.S. Senator, Vice President, and President of the United States, uh, Harry S. Truman, who led a battery of the 35th Division, a National Guard unit, out of Kansas and Missouri. Once the artillery blast hit the Germans, the Americans went forward. The Germans were again, for the most part, caught off guard. They knew an attack was coming. They thought it was probably coming from the San Miel area, but they had no idea that it would be directed towards the Meuse Argonne. And then around 5.30 in the morning, the infantry kicked off. And besides the machine gun nests, they were facing bands upon bands of wire. So when the infantry troops would go forward, they'd have engineers leading the way with wire cutters who hopefully could snip through the wire that the artillery didn't penetrate. This would slow the troops down. Uh, the battle itself was, um, the planning by Pershing was very difficult. I won't get into the great details. Bill will talk about the Battle of Montfaucon, which was the major objective of the American troops that day. It took them two days to take it, uh, dis despite Pershing's chagrin. But the first day of fighting, the Americans did quite well. Because they caught the Germans by surprise, they moved forward. Although not taking Montfaucon, they met most of their objectives. Uh, American troops who were in the Argonne Forest, mainly the 77th New York Division of uh, National Army troops, penetrated as well. But that second day after Montfaucon, things completely broke down. The Germans 
saw where the attack was coming from. They brought up resources, men and equipment, supplies from other parts of the front, and they completely stalled the American attack. In fact, it would stay stalled for many days afterwards, and it would become a frustrating fight for Pershing and the other Allied commanders who were questioning why he was leading the first army along with the entire AEF and starting to say, we told you so. You should have amalgamated our troops with ours, and we wouldn't have this problem. Also on that first day, a tank attack um, led by Patton. When Patton came over, he was first an aide, and then he became um, head of the new tank corps. He learned from the French. He was a trainer. Eventually, he led a brigade. He's the best-known tank officer in World War I for the Americans, and you might even think that he led the tank corps, which was not the case. But on the first day of Meuse-Argonne, in support of the 35th Division near the village of Chepy, he was in the woods. Some of the tanks got blocked, bogged down in the trenches, in shell holes. Um, Patton, who was notorious for his um, temper, um, was leading the way on foot, started screaming at the tank officers, ordered them to dig out. It took a while, but eventually he got the tanks free. They moved forward. Next thing you know, though, a machine gun blast in this deep wooded area catches per, uh, Patton right between uh, the legs and the thigh area, not far from his groin, comes out his buttocks. He's badly wounded, bleeding profusely. His aide drags him into a shell hole. Somehow they are able to stop the bleeding. Meanwhile, the fighting is continuing, and it'll take at least a few hours before they can get a litter, an ambulance to him. They do get him out. They do bring him back to the rear. The war is over for George S. Patton. Uh, he would go on to become promoted uh, to the full rank of colonel. He would get a DSC for his fighting. He did ask for the Medal of Honor, never got that. He went back to France in 1920 and shot a picture of himself in the area around Chepy. Uh, tanks themselves, just as an aside, were, especially for the Americans, were largely ineffective. It was difficult terrain to maneuver through and uh, compasses, which the tank officers usually were about two to a tank, and these were all either French Renaults or uh, British Mark IVs or Fives, found it difficult. Air, air power during the battle was also difficult because it rained so often, cloud cover. But Billy Mitchell, who was leading the uh, American Air Forces at the time, was a constant uh, presence around Su Yi, pushing Pershing to allow more air power. Pershing could care less about him. But the, um, when the planes could go up, they were largely effective as far as observation. Bombing at that time was very rudimentary. But what the planes would do is they would observe where the enemy was and send the signals back to the field artillery so they could um, range their guns. One of the pilots who was shot down early in the war is this guy, Marion Cooper. You may not know of him as a pilot during World War I. He ended up getting captured and would spend the rest of the war in a German POW camp. After the war, he went back in the military and actually served along with the Russians. But you probably know him more as a director and cinematographer for the original King Kong. The best known pilot during the war is Eddie Rickenbacker, future president of Eastern Airlines. He was the American ace with 26 victories. There might have been another ace by the name of Frank Luke, the balloon buster, but he was shot down and killed on the 28th, even though he had accumulated a number of victories at that point. Uh, Rickenbacker was very daring. He was a good pilot as part of the 94th Aero Squadron, and he wrote a wonderful book about his experience if you want to learn more um, the Flying Circus. Meanwhile, the battle is bogging down, and into early October, about 100 years ago from today, it looks horrible. You look at this image here, and these are American supply wagons trying to go forward. You would think this is something from the American Civil War. Again, I can't stress to you how tough the roads were. They were muddy. They were pockmarked. Engineers would try and fill in the holes with stones, with wood, but it was very difficult to get water, fresh supplies, troops forward. American troops were losing contact with their own units, and it was a real mess. And the Allied commanders, especially Foch, also Douglas Haig of the British, were calling for Pershing's head, saying, we need to sack him. We need to get rid of him. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's causing the rest of the Allied offenses 
to also bog down, which I don't agree with. Um, the Allies themselves were also having trouble against the Germans. The Germans were just darn good soldiers, and they were heavily entrenched all over the Western Front. Meanwhile, as the fighting goes on, um, two of the heroes at the time, uh, Major Sam Woodfill in the 5th Division, a regular Army officer, scrapped his way through the woods near Cunel, um, saved a number of his troops from certain death. He would go on uh, to be awarded with the Medal of Honor after the war. And, of course, Sergeant um, Alvin York, who um, captured 132 uh, German troops in an effort to um, relieve the Lost Battalion, the subject of um, Ed's latest book, and he could talk more about that. Um, I can't talk in the MacArthur archives without mentioning Douglas MacArthur, of course, a very flamboyant guy. Uh, he would get wounded at least twice, be the recipient of seven silver stars, a couple of purple hearts, and two distinguished service crosses during the war. He would end up being, of course, a brigade commander in the fabled uh, Rainbow Division and help break the German line at the Côte de Château. Wounded are piling up. There are thousands of them, of American troops, by shell, by gunfire, by gas. And by mid-October, things are not looking good for the Americans. Two of the nurses who cared for the American troops, and this is a, sadly one of the tragedies of the war, were the Cromwell sisters, wealthy New Yorkers who had no business going to the war, but they wanted to do their part, volunteered with the American Red Cross, were at the thick of the fighting in the front at a mobile field hospital, taking care of American troops who lost limbs, were suffocating from gas. At the end of the war, it was all too much for them, and on the ship, Heading back to the United States in 1919, they went overboard, wrote a letter, and jumped over the ship. Pershing, meanwhile, is feeling the pressure, and he decides he needs to reorganize. So what he does is he smartly steps down as first army commander, still continues to command the first army, but he puts in his place the guy to the left, uh, Major General, now Lieutenant General Hunter Liggett, Commander First Corps, the most competent general officer in the war. He also creates a second army, which he puts in under uh, Robert Lee Bullard, who Bill will talk um, a fair deal about. Second army actually didn't do a whole lot as the war continued. Liggett, on the other hand, really turns the fighting around. He reorganizes the troops, but he's got a lot to deal with, and one of those is the influenza pandemic. There were something like 150,000 cases of American troops in First Army. It was decimating not only First Army, but all of the belligerents, not to mention worldwide. And here on the East Coast of the United States, um, American citizens were suffering terribly. Finally, Liggett organizes what ultimately would be the final battle of the Meuse-Argonne. It takes place on November 1st of 1918. The jump-off would involve two divisions. The second division, which um, Ed will talk about, is having fought at Bella Wood, and then also during the Champagne in conjunction with Meuse-Argonne, plus a relatively... Um, uh, raw Division, the 89th and National Army Division. At this point, the Germans knew the end was up, and they had been negotiating to get an armistice behind the scenes, but they also weren't giving up entirely. German troops were um, surrendering by the hundreds each day, but Liggett launched the attack. It was successful. It drove the Germans across the Meuse River, Meuse River had them trapped up on the Meuse Heights, and so by the time of the armistice, the uh, Germans had given up in that area. And to go back to my original point, because the Meuse-Argonne battle, the Germans were soundly defeated by the Americans, and it was the main catalyst to really push the, them to accept an armistice. As Chris alluded to, everybody thought the war was going to go into 1919. The Americans persevered. They learned how to circle around the German positions. And through Liggett's leadership and just sheer force and a steep learning curve, the Americans pushed through, but it was a heavily costly battle. Out of 1.2 million Americans who fought in that 47-day battle, somewhere around 27,000 of them were killed, more than 100,000 were wounded. After the fighting ended, Graves Registration Troops went to recover the burials. Meanwhile, the American government had made an agreement with um, the families who had loved ones overseas and said, we will take care of your fallen in perpetuity 
in permanent cemeteries or at government expense will bring them back to the United States. About 70% of the American families elected to have their bodies returned in burial in national cemeteries or local cemeteries. The 30% are overseas and now cemeteries maintained by the American Battle Monuments Commission like the Muse Argon Cemetery, which has four, more than 14,000 burials there. It's the largest American cemetery in Europe, even larger than the uh, Normandy Cemetery. So that's a quick wrap up of the Muse Argon, a little bit about General Pershing. Thank you for your time and attendance. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please contact Amanda Williams at amanda.williams at norfolk.gov.